All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah Husky. I'm with the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Ren. I have started recording this course, which will be posted on 3C Ren's on-demand page. Um, and you will also receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email. Uh, so the course that we want to welcome you to is an introduction to Passive House. Our instructor for today's course is Steve Mann with the Passive House Network and Home Energy Services. Before we get going, I just have a couple of slides to run through. Next slide. Uh, we ask that everyone make sure they're on mute throughout the duration of the course. If you would like to verbally ask a question, please raise your hand in the participant section and we will call on you to unmute yourself. Uh, we encourage you to participate and ask questions through the chat box as well. Next slide. All right, so just a few words about who we are. Uh, we are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Bren. We are a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, working to improve energy efficiency in our region. Uh, 3C REN is funded by ratepayer dollars, which are collected through the public goods charge found on our utility bills. And the benefit of being ratepayer funded is that there's no cost to those we serve and we are able to return these dollars back to our local economy. Uh, 3C REN currently offers three programs. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first program is the Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals by offering Title 24 support for everyone from plans examiners and inspectors uh, to architects and contractors. This program also offers the Energy Code Coach service, which is an over the phone, online and in the field support for Title 24 questions. Next slide, thank you. Another program we offer is the Building Performance Training, which serves building professionals um, by offering technical and soft skill trainings related to building science principles, high performance buildings, and marketing and communication techniques. And we also have our Home Energy Savings Program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. Uh, you may see a few 3C REN staff members on the training today. If you see anyone with this background, feel free to chat with them directly uh, with any questions you may have. And with that, I'll pass things over to Steve. Welcome. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to see you. My name's Steve Mann. I'm out of Berkeley, uh, but I used to live in San Luis Obispo for about 14 years, a little while ago. So this feels a little bit like coming home. I do see some familiar faces out there. So uh, uh, nice to see all of you. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, what we're going to do is a quick, this is sort of like a, a broad overview of Passive House. Uh, it's not terribly technical or terribly geeky. Um, for those of you that like that kind of thing, there's some other trainings that will be available fairly soon. So you can really dive into this a bit more. Uh, but I'm just going to sort of like um, acquaint you a bit with some of the principles and some of the benefits of Passive House. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I am a trainer for the Passive House Network uh, out of New York, uh, but I'm also a certified Passive House designer and tradesperson and building certifier too. So I've been doing Passive House related projects for about 15 years now. Um, and Pretty much everything I do is passive house at this point. I used to do other sustainability things like lead. Um, I'm a certified energy analyst. So I've, I've constantly been doing um, energy code, California energy code calculations, things of that sort. Um, energy star, you know, so on and so forth. All the sustainability things. But uh, right now, since I was introduced to passive house about almost 15 years ago, um, it became clear to me that this was the only way to build buildings that I made the transition and I haven't looked back. And so uh, hopefully I can convince you all to do the same. We'll see. 
Okay, here is the challenge of what we do with our buildings does matter. Uh, from I mean, the, the thing that we hear about a lot in the, the context of the climate crisis is uh, energy and carbon emissions and things of that sort. Well, that's certainly part of it, uh, but there's a lot more too. There's this whole question of providing affordable, high quality, um, good quality buildings for everybody. Uh, here in California, uh, well, in lots of parts of the world, from what I've seen in my travels, there are people that don't have homes. Um, there are tent camps here and there, things of that sort. Uh, that by itself is, is a criminal thing, I think, personally. And it's solvable. Uh, but what we need to do is, is build buildings that are suitable for everybody, that are healthy, that are low carbon, that are um, have good indoor air quality, things of that sort, something for everybody. Uh, and as climate change uh, becomes a bigger issue, as we have more um, lately snow things up in the Sierras and wildfires in Northern California and Southern California and uh, things of this sort, we just need to focus on these things more. And building better buildings is part of the solution to these various problems. You know, passive health alone does not solve all these issues but it is part of the solution. Absolutely no question about it. So this is what we can do with our architecture, with our designs. We can eliminate carbon. Now this is, there are two types of carbon when we talk about that. One is related to energy efficiency, that's called operational carbon. So this is the amount of carbon that's created and put into the atmosphere from operating buildings. That's one aspect of it. But the other part of this whole carbon issue with is what's called body carbon. And that's the carbon that's created in the process of creating building material before they even get put into a building and how you manufacture those, how much carbon is created out of that carbon that's created by transporting those materials to a building site and so on and so forth. So it's a complex set of issues just talking about carbon. Carbon's an easy word but it's got many nuances to it, okay? Uh, the other thing, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna protect the health of everybody in the building. We wanna have high quality ventilation. We wanna have high quality air. We wanna have well filtered air that's refreshed from the outside, not recirculating air. Um, that's not the best way to get high quality air on the inside, okay? Uh, and this is something that everybody benefits from. So we need to make sure we can do that. Uh, we need to look at resilience in the face of the climate issues we're having, where we have power outages, where we have wildfires, where we have floods, where we have things of this sort. Uh, it's not uncommon. I'm sorry, the uh, PowerPoint keeps advancing my slides without my permission. So I'll, I'm going to be adjusting a little bit. Uh, we need to provide resilient shelters so that if we do have a power outage for a few hours, for a few days uh, in a harsher climate, uh, our buildings need to keep us relatively comfortable as best as they can. And I'll show you some details about what that really means in a few minutes. We need to deliver affordability. Everybody should be able to have a roof over their head. It doesn't have to be an awesome roof. It doesn't have to be an architecturally designed masterpiece but it should be comfortable and durable and healthy. Um, everybody deserves that. And we should be putting things in place to make that happen. Uh, the other thing that we talk about, and then this is, this is something um, that gets ignored a lot is future-proofing the investment, especially in the hot California real estate market. Um, values do go up most of the time, not always, uh, but most of the time. And we should be able to protect those investments. And that's partly by having a resilient building, uh, but it's also partly by having a building that consumes very little um, fuel of whatever type. And um, we'd like to make sure that when we spend a certain amount of money for a building that 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, you're gonna have that value at least, um, or ideally a better value than that. But that's not the focus of what we're talking about here. This is not a financial seminar, but it's something that, it comes into play at times, especially when people are making decisions about what to spend now when they're building a house, 
as opposed to what it's worth 20 years down the road. So what came before this? Well, there were all kinds of things. Well, here's just a few examples. Um, the vernacular in China, this is, I'm not quite sure what the detail are here. I've, I've never seen much on this kind of building, but there have been historical precedents over the years from hundreds or thousands of years ago where people were building buildings that were smart and that they took advantage of passive solar, passive cooling, shading, uh, solar math, things of that, or I'm sorry, thermal math, things of that sort. Um, so that's a long time ago. Uh, a little more recently, there was this, uh, the polar ship, the Fram in 1893. This was a super insulated ship that went to uh, Antarctica and it had triple pane windows. And as a heat source, it had one lamp on the inside of the ship. And everybody was comfortable in that ship for quite a long time for the length of the voyage. Um, that's the only ship of that type that I'm familiar with or that I'm aware of. Uh, more recently in North America and in Europe, starting, you know, in like the 60s and the 70s, there was a, a movement towards passive solar types of things, uh, which incorporated some of the, the principles that the passive house process uh, later incorporated. Um, lots of examples here. You can see, you know, Germany, Canada, the United States, Denmark, uh, they were all over the place. Lots of people were dabbling in these kinds of things, trying to find a good solution for building affordable, comfortable houses that didn't use much energy. So, uh, what happened was uh, some folks in Germany drew on some of this research and incorporated it into what became known as, as passive house principle. Uh, the Passive House Institute was formed about 25 years ago, uh, and they built the first Passive House. It was actually a, a fourplex. It's uh, four row houses, and the founder of the Passive House Institute still lives on the one on the far left. Um, and what they did was they, they incorporated a lot of international principles, a lot of historical things from the previous slide, all types of sources, but looked at it very scientifically and created a, a series of equations and a, a mathematical and a physics-based analysis that said, okay, when we build a house, if we do these things, will it be healthy? Will it be comfortable? Uh, will it have good indoor temperatures, good indoor air quality, so on and so forth? And so that evolved out of this. And what happened was um, they determined that in fact, if you create this healthy interior environment um, in this kind of building, that as a side effect, you save energy, you radically reduce the energy consumption of the building. That was not the original intent, but that just sort of fell out of this whole thing. Uh, and that's sort of the thing when people talk about passive health, they have a tendency to focus on the energy aspect. Well, that's not how it started. It started on healthy, durable, indoor comfort. Okay, uh, here is sort of like the statement of this the comfort and health driven performance. It's in Spanish. I don't know why it's in Spanish on this slide, uh, but it is. Um, I guess it's one way to demonstrate that the passive house process has been translated into quite a few languages and there are buildings all over the planet that incorporate these, these principles. Um, so, it's designed to be, and I'm going to quote here. Let's see if I can find the quote. Passive house is a building for which thermal comfort, according to ISO 7730, can be achieved solely by post-heating or post-cooling of the fresh air mass, which is required to achieve sufficient indoor air quality condition without the need for additional recirculation of air. That's kind of like, that's the ISO uh, description of the sort of like the driving principle behind the passive house process. But there's definitely more details than that. Um, that's sort of like the, the guiding principle. Uh, it begins with an energy balance. When we analyze a passive house, uh, we look at the whole enclosure. Um, and this is designed to, we don't look at the whole enclosure to save energy. Like I said, that's a byproduct. We look at it to reduce the energy consumption but to provide indoor comfort uh, and an indoor quality environment. So that's where this comes from. And by doing this, 
we can literally reduce the energy consumption of a building by 70, 80, 90%. Um, the heating and cooling loads are minimal. Um, uh, but more importantly, the people living in the house are extremely comfortable. I'm currently living in, in the passive house that my wife and I designed and, and built. And uh, it's extremely comfortable and extremely quiet. The air quality is great. Um, uh, I love it. My wife loves it. We're very happy here. And everybody I know that lives in a passive house feels the same way. Now, this is uh, decoupling power and performance. So what we're doing here is we want to separate, like in the computer industry, computers keep getting more and more powerful and they're using less and less energy. Passive house kind of has the same underlying principle. Uh, we want to keep making them perform better and better and better, uh, but using less and less energy. Now the passive house process is not a moving target. It is a fixed target, essentially. When you design one of these buildings, there are hard numbers that you wanna meet. Um, and that's because they determined that by decoupling power and performance, and then finding these thresholds to really hit the sweet spot um, that you can build these buildings and you can do them cost effectively and they're very helpful. And this is normal. This should be normal. And this is why when I first learned about passive health, that was my thought. Well, of course, this makes sense. This should be normal. We should be doing this all the time. Passive houses provide comfort. Um, this is a, a picture from, from one of them. It's, I believe it's in New York in the middle of winter. Um, I'll show you more details on what this really means in terms of the numbers and things. But essentially, you should be able to sit by the windows in the middle of winter, uh, even in the kinds of storms they're having up in Aho right now and trucking in the mountains, and you should be comfortable. You're not going to be 72 degrees warm, but you're going to be at least, say, 65 degrees warm, uh, which is pretty comfortable. Okay. And I already mentioned peace and quiet. Uh, passive houses, because of the quality of the windows and because of the air tightness of the enclosure, or can be incredibly quiet. Uh, in our house, we live about uh, six blocks from a, ma a major rail line that runs right through Berkeley. And the trains come through in the middle of the night, blaring their horns on a nightly basis. And when we close the windows, we'll still hear some of that noise, um, but it's not the kind of noise that wakes us up with a rush of adrenaline, like the train is barreling through the house. Um, uh, it's just like a little reminder that, yes, um, we live in a passive house and there is a little bit of noise, but it's just fine. You know. The other thing that's really important is uh, passive houses provide hygiene. Uh, they have specific methodologies for making sure that there's not going to be any mold, condensation, moisture buildup, uh, mildew, things of this sort that help contribute towards uh, a very unhealthy indoor air quality. We actually do this for specific points in the building. Uh, now I'm not gonna talk about that. That gets into some of the geeky stuff, but you need to know that that's, that's an essential part of the analysis when you're designing a passive house, just to make sure that this kind of thing cannot happen at all, period. Here's the resilience factor. Okay, this is uh, from the polar vortex in 2014 in New York. Uh, the house is shown on the right. It's a passive house retrofit. Uh, temperatures, you know, range between 50 Fahrenheit and down to almost zero Fahrenheit over the course of, um, I believe this was a week, almost two weeks, 10 days, it looks like. Uh, the indoor temperature hovered between 68 and 72 the whole time. Uh, they only turned on the heat once. Okay, it doesn't show that on the slide, but I have that in my notes. Uh, the indoor relative humidity flowed between 40 and 60 the whole time. And then the black line is the temperature fluctuation. Uh, so you should be able to do this in pretty much any climate zone um, with a minimum expenditure of energy. And so you should have good, healthy, relative humidity, good, comfortable indoor air temperatures, regardless of what's happening outside. That's again, one of the goals of the passive house process. Towards equity and security in a variety of ways. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of different buildings besides this one. This is a 
senior affordable housing complex in New York, brand new construction. Um, the upper stories are the senior housing. The lower floor is a community center and a library. And I believe it's got a pre-K school on the ground floor. That's what it looks like, yeah. Uh, so if they just combine all these things. It's good for the neighborhood because it's got neighborhood services. It's good for the children, it has children's services. It's good for the seniors because they're living in affordable, comfortable housing in a neighborhood that supports this kind of development. Um, so everybody wins. The other thing that the passive house process does is supports the green power change. Uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you at some point now have heard about the move towards electrification. It seems that almost everybody in California, everybody, every jurisdiction or a large number of them, last time I counted it was 40 or 50, but that was three or four months ago, uh, want to be all electric. They want people to have heat pumps and induction cooktops and things of that sort, get rid of fossil fuels, get rid of um, gas lines, get rid of natural gas, all of these kinds of things. Well, the Path of House Institute predicted that this was going to happen about seven or eight years ago. They assumed that the world was going to pivot in this direction. They were ahead of their time in this respect. And so when you do an analysis of a Path of House, it incorporates uh, how you view your energy mix and whether you are using a 100% renewable, uh, what your grid component is in terms of renewable and renewables that you have on the building. So it incorporates all of those types of things. Now the California Energy Code is just starting to look at that kind of stuff too. Um, but I personally believe that the passive house analysis of this is, is a little more detailed, a little bit on target because um, they've been doing this for a while now. It gets factored in, that's the important thing. Okay, so how do you do this? You pretty much have to do things differently from what you normally do uh, in terms of building design and building construction. And uh, when we talk about this, we talk about flipping the equation. Uh, essentially, you know, starting all over again to a certain extent, uh, looking at some basic physics elements, some basic design elements, and uh, you know, just it's sort of like restarting the process, okay? Instead of relying on precedents from the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, essentially building codes as they exist, ignore the building code, create something from scratch that just turns out to be much better than what the building codes require in this day and age uh, in almost all cases, okay? So that's, that's where they started. Um, it is a team sport. We've talked in, in the building trades for years, I've heard the phrase integrated design team, integrated project team. I've done a lot of lead projects over the years and they talk about that. Uh, well, the reality is, is that most of the projects I've been involved in, and there have been dozens over the years, maybe, maybe a couple hundred, I'm not sure. Um, the integrated design team was a great thing on paper, but it hardly ever happened. Well, if you want to successfully design and build a passive house, you almost you pretty much have to have an integrated design team. Everybody needs to be engaged. That's from the design process from from day one, essentially, up through the building of the building. So you include all the design professionals, um, the structural engineers, the architects, uh, the mechanical engineers, but you also include all the tradespeople as well: general contractor, the sub trades, everybody. It's a, it's a team sport and it's a hands-on sport. Um, so everybody, in order for this to be a successful process, everybody needs to be involved with a certain degree at least. Okay. Uh, what, when you do this, you do get better energy flows, reduced energy flows and better balances on the inside. Okay. This is not abstract. We actually measure this stuff and we look at these buildings. Here's like an infrared picture of a building. Um, this is not a passive house building. This is a building that it, the brighter colors, the yellows and the reds and the oranges are an indication of heat energy escaping from this building shell in the winter time and going to the outside. So you throw a lot of heat into a building and then you just let it move. Instead of heating the inside, you end up 
hating Mother Nature, which I'm sure she enjoys, but it doesn't do anything for the the people that live in the building, the people that operate the building. Um, it just doesn't work. So this is one of the things we focus on. Uh, do we have the imagination? Well, well, we do, I think, is the answer. Uh, this example right here is this goes back to the um, uh, the Middle Ages when they discovered flying buttresses. Uh, you can't see them. They're on the outside of this building, but it's basically a structural support on the outside that holds the building up. And they could create these massive soaring structures, you know, that 40, 50, 80, 100 feet tall with glass almost everywhere. Uh, and then the structural elements were architectural features on the inside and structural elements on the outside. Um, they just reimagined what they were doing architecturally and from a building perspective. And this is the way we like to think with Passive House. This Passive House reimagines the building because it looks at it from a different perspective. There are lots of different types of Passive Houses. This is a rapidly moving area. 15 years ago, when I started looking at this, there were not a lot of passive house buildings. Uh, certainly in California, there weren't any. The first one was in about uh, 2014, I believe. It was a, a three unit uh, Habitat for Humanity project that happened to be in Santa Barbara. Uh, I know this because I certified the project uh, and the architect, um, he was, the, he was a, uh, what's the, a groundbreaker for new construction. There was an attempt to do a retrofit in Berkeley in 2010. Um, it didn't quite get certified because they didn't quite hit the blower door testing requirements. But again, it sort of got things kickstarted a bit. That was 10 to 15 years ago. Now we're seeing stuff like this all over the world. We don't have anything like this in California yet, but we're seeing this all over the place. Um, you know, this is Vienna, New York, Vancouver, Boston. There's a whole subdevelopment in China that is a massive subdevelopment. I'm not even sure how large it is. It's, it's like acres and acres and acres with housing and community services designed to house multiple millions of people. And it's a whole city essentially that's being built to pass it out principle. A similar thing exists in Brussels. There are certain communities in the world that are saying, okay, uh, now if you're gonna build a building in this jurisdiction, uh, regardless of what kind of building it is, it has to meet the passive health principles and you have to certify. So things are moving pretty rapidly, uh, which is good. Okay. So let's see on the left, it's banking headquarters. Uh, the one second from the left is the mixed youth development in Manhattan. Uh, the one on the, the second from the right is a uh, residential tower in Vancouver. And the one on the far right is again, a mixed use high rise in Boston. Um, these don't look like, there's nothing strange or unusual about these that screams passive house. They just look like interesting architectural buildings, but they are all passive house buildings or will be when they're done and certified. No. Uh, even more interesting, this is sort of like our poster child for the most unusual passive house so far in the world that, well, I'm not sure if it's the most unusual, but we like to trot this out as, you know, as the really interesting one. It's a garment factory. And it was, this is a retrofit. This wasn't built from scratch. They, it, was a, it was a factory that was gutted and retrofit to passive house standards. And it meets all the criteria. It's healthy, it's comfortable, uh, good indoor air quality, um, you know, very little energy consumption. And it is still a garment factory, okay? So they, they build clothes in there, or they, I guess they sew clothes. Building clothes is probably not the right description, okay? Uh, gorgeous building. Uh, in a very, um, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a hot, humid climate. So if you can build this kind of thing there, you can pretty much do it anywhere, I'd say. Here's another example from the UK. This is a Sterling Fry winner. It's a, a residential uh, construction, a brand new building. Um, so this goes to show you that not only can you do pass the house buildings in somewhat hostile climates, you can also do them such that they're architecturally very interesting and distinctive, such that uh, a jury of architectural peers gives them an award. So it's a great looking building, I think. I would live there in a minute. Uh, we have lots of examples of this kind of thing, but they're not all prize winners because there aren't that many prizes to go around. 
All right. This is a big question. How much does it cost? And just like everything, the answer is, well, it depends. Uh, but I just want to give you uh, one example. Okay, this is from a study in Pennsylvania uh, done between 2015 and 2018. Uh, we have this in California. We have something called low-income housing tax credits. I'm not sure if this is a nationwide thing or just only in certain states, but Pennsylvania has one of these programs where if you build to certain standards, um, you get tax credits from the state. And the quantity of tax credits depends on the quality of the building. And they have a way of determining the quality of the building. One thing that gets factored in at times in certain jurisdictions is, well, was it built to pass the house criteria or not? In Pennsylvania, they folded that into their criteria, okay? And then what they did was over this three-year period, they took all these projects, the ones that were passive house and the ones that weren't, and plotted them on a cost per square footage. And you can see from the graph, um, the median was sort of like right in the middle with the black and blue dotted line. Passive house projects were above and below the square footage costs, and so were the market rate or the conventional housing, okay? But it just goes to show you that it is definitely possible to build passive house buildings. In this case, these were all multifamily buildings at below market rate uh, prices. Now, if you want to apply that same question to single family residential from my own personal experience, I'd say, well, that's really not the case. Single family residential is probably going to cost a little bit more than market rate currently. But I've seen, I've seen numbers as low as say 3% higher than market rate costs for single family passive house. I've also seen numbers that were say 15% higher. So it really kind of depends on, on how you're crunching the numbers and how you're going about creating the passive house, what your design principles are and how you achieve that. Um, it can be done, okay? So in order for this to happen, you need to work with a certifier from day one, okay? That's a person that is actually going to review the design and the construction. Uh, this is not a building inspector. This is sort of like a, a, a paper review process uh, because they count on the building trade and the general contract of people building the building to actually provide documentation about the construction process. The passive house certifier actually reviews the design early on uh, and says, okay, well, once you hit your construction documents, you should have your design pretty well locked down and you know that you're going to achieve the passive house um, requirements, assuming that the building is built according to the construction documents. That's the intent. So in order for that to happen, you have to pretty much assume passive house from day one. It's hard to do it as an atom because by the time you get to construction documents, so many decisions have been made about how the building is going to be built that you may have incorporated things that pretty much are going to prevent you from reaching the passive house principle. Okay. Start on day one, get a certifier on board, get the team involved. Like I said, that's everybody, okay? Optimize as best you can and stick with it and make sure that as things change during construction, you make sure that you tell your certifier and your estimate house consultant and everyone else, things have changed. I run into this pretty frequently. Sometimes it's an unpleasant surprise on a building that's going for certification. So you just have to, Team communication is very important. You keep doing those kinds of things and you keep sticking with the principles uh, and you can build things at market rate. How is this possible? Okay. Uh, it's a predictable process, totally predictable. Um, there is a, a certain set of numbers. When you design a passive house, uh, it's analyzed and it's modeled, and there are certain specific numbers that have to be hit. One is an infiltration rate, uh, one is the heating demand, one is the cooling demand. Uh, there's the ones I mentioned about mold and mildew uh, likelihood, so on and so forth. So you have to hit all these things. If you follow the methodology and you take advantage of the research materials and you use the passive house planning package shown on the upper right, which is the official modeling tool and you use it properly and correctly, you can do this. Uh, it's easier if you use certified components, which are shown on the left. 
and you use certified professionals. We have certified designers, consultants, tradespeople, certifiers, et cetera, et cetera. There's a variety of certifications that you can get. Um, if you incorporate all these things, this is definitely possible and it is predictable. And you know before you break ground that you have a good chance of um, actually building a passive house successfully. There are three certification levels. Uh, the one on the far left is the one that was created 25 plus years ago. Um, that's the one that most people do. But remember I mentioned that Passive House predicted the transition of the grid from fossil fuels to renewable. Well, the, the two certifications on the right, the plus and the premium levels, uh, I was gonna say reward you for putting renewables on the building. Well, they don't reward you, it just acknowledges that you've reduced your impact on the grid more significantly than the certification on the left. Um, and so it sort of says, yes, this is the direction we ought to be going in. You're going in that direction more so than maybe a different passive house. Thank you very much. Great job. There is also a retrofit standard. Okay, again, with specific thresholds, they're different from new construction. They're a little more flexible but they're not terribly flexible. They're still fairly tough to meet. Uh, and again, like a new construction, there are three levels that incorporate uh, the renewables component. So the classic is no renewables or the renewable component is not a critical benchmark involved in that. Then the plus and the premium, same thing. The more renewables, uh, the greater your tier level can be. There are a bunch of certifiers. I remember a couple of slides ago, it said get the certifier involved early. Yes, I highly recommend that. Um, there are, in, North, in the United States alone, there are 13 certifiers. These are not individuals. Well, some of them like myself are, uh, but some of them are larger organizations with two or three people on staff. Some of these are have many, many people. They're not all certifiers, but many people that are involved in passive house construction. So there are resources out there um, if you wanna go that route. And I pretty much would say, you build a passive house and you don't certify it, it's not a passive house. You're just claiming that it's a passive house. Uh, the only way you can really be sure is to certify it. And that involves a little bit of testing, commissioning, documentation, review by third parties, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's easy to claim passive house it's a little bit harder to do passive health. But it is doable. I don't want to be discouraging. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about how you do this actually. This is this is the nuts and bolts as we're going to get. Okay. There are five key principles. Uh, there are lots of nuances, but these are the, the five big bullet points. Uh, okay, first of all, climate specific insulation level. Uh, and just like everything, it depends. I found that in a lot of California, certainly in the climate zones that I work in, which ranges from Southern California up to Arcata, more towards the coast, less out in the hotter portions of the state, that uh, two by six walls with two to three inches of exterior insulation is perfectly adequate uh, to meet passive house requirements. Uh, but again, that don't quote me on that, it depends. Uh, every project, every site condition, uh, every site with specific conditions are different. Um, so you don't know, you have to do the analysis. Okay, so climate and site specific insulation level, that's number one. Number two is thermal bridge free connection. A thermal bridge is any place in a building where you can have unwanted or uh, higher levels than normal of um, thermal energy movement. Okay, now that can be from the outside to the inside or from the inside to the outside. It essentially amounts to uh, BTU leakage based on some very specific physics principles. And it usually happens in buildings where you have intersections. Uh, like you'll see in the picture there, it shows intersections at the foundation and the wall. It can happen at the wall to the roof intersection. It can happen where the windows intersect the wall, skylights intersect the roof, those kinds of things, where you have a change in a building assembly from one assembly to another, those kinds of things. So you have to identify those and look at them carefully and determine if they are thermal bridge free and if they're not, how to make them 
relatively thermal bridge free. Okay. Uh, number three, air tightness. This is the number one thing you can do for a building, whether you're pursuing a passive health or not. If you're doing a retrofit just to make a building better, the number one thing you can do is make it as airtight as possible and ventilate it um, because it has a huge number of benefits. Interestingly, this is the one that in my experience for first time passive health builders, this is the one that um, gives them the most heartburn because they've never really done it before. They've never really been tested. All of the other parts here you can see on the, on the slide here have pretty much been determined ahead of time during the design phase. Uh, but the air tightness is done during the construction phase and the devil is in the detail. And everybody needs to be on board with this. And this requires a certain amount of vigilance. Uh, it requires paying more attention than uh, builders would normally pay attention to in a co-built house because this is not something they have to achieve. Uh, makes them nervous when you build a passive house and you do your first blower door test. If the builder hits their air tightness number, everybody is extremely happy. It's sort of like, it's a, it's a eureka moment. It's like, oh my God, we did it. Awesome, you know, it's, it's great. Um, it's, it's when people break out the pizza and beer or the champagne and, you know, and celebrate and they go home early, yeah. Um, so number four is high performance windows and doors with solar protection. Well, high performance windows and doors does not necessarily mean triple pane doors and windows. It might, depends on the climate zone, remember, and it depends on the site condition. Uh, in lots of places in California, double pane windows are actually pretty adequate uh, to reach passive house requirements, depending on what you've done with other parts of the building. This is a synergistic process. You don't just, throw windows at a project and solve the problem. It's the combination of the windows and the insulation and the heat recovery and the shading and the thermal bridge analysis and everything, okay? Uh, you wanna have the highest quality windows you can afford that achieve the goal. And you wanna make sure that you analyze in detail of the solar aspect of those windows. It says on the slide, solar protection, well, you may or may not want or need protection. Every climate is different. In Southern California, solar protection is probably something you're gonna want. In uh, the Bay Area, if the site is surrounded by trees or other buildings, you probably don't want or need solar protection. It all depends. You do the analysis, you find out, okay? Uh, regardless of the solar protection though, the, the higher R value of a window the less thermal transfer you have through that window. Windows are the weakest part of a building shell. And so you wanna make them as um, robust as you can, okay? Um, then finally, high efficiency heat recovery, ventilation. A passive house is tight. Number three is air tightness, it's extremely tight. And so you wanna have constant 24, seven, 365, ventilation that brings in filtered fresh air all the time. This goes back to the healthy, comfortable, high quality indoor environment that we're trying to achieve. It comes from the highly efficient ventilation. The other thing you get here though, is the heat recovery. Now what that means is, uh, and I'll just give you an example. Let's say it's 40 degrees outside and 70 degrees inside. And this is balanced ventilation. So you're bringing in fresh air from outside at 40 degrees and exhausting stale air at 70 degrees. Those two air streams pass each other very closely. They don't commingle, they're separated, but they pass each other. And the heat from the outgoing air, the 70 degree, gets transferred to the incoming air. So that the incoming air, before it gets in the building, the temperature gets raised from 40 to say maybe 65 or 68 or maybe even 70, depends. And the outgoing air, the temperature of that drops from 70 to let's say 45 or 50 or something, okay? So essentially you keep bringing in fresh air, but you keep the heat in the building, inside of the building as best you can. And the same thing happens during the summertime with cooling too. You can get a certain amount of cooling aspect from the ventilation system. Not as much as the heating, but you can do that too. What that does is that minimizes the amount of additional energy you have to introduce into the building to keep it a comfortable temperature. 
because you're keeping that uh, heat in the building. Okay, it doesn't escape or it escapes very, very little. Um, these are the five key principles. And I think we've got a few more details on these now. Uh, maybe not. Okay. Um, Steve, just to yes. uh, interrupt really quick, I just wanted to give you uh, a time check that we have about 15 minutes left. Okay, good. Thank you very much. All You're right. welcome. Um, let's see. Yes. Okay. I might have to speed up get to here. Okay. So this is how you do it. You use something called the Passive House Planning Package, which is a modeling software that was developed and certified by the Passive House Institute. Uh, this is the only way you can get a certified Passive House is to build a model in this piece of software. It's a large Excel worksheet uh, with about um, 30 a spreadsheet with about 30 worksheets to it. Um, it does both residential and non-residential buildings, um, and it's quite detailed. Um, this is why we have passive house consultants and designers. We generally know how this works well uh, because it takes a bit of practice, a bit of training, and a bit of understanding of the nuances. Uh, but once you figure this out, um, this is how you determine if a building as designed can achieve passive house standards. Okay, talked about insulation already. Um, I've already said the right amount of insulation for the climate zone and the climate uh, situation, the climate specific of the site. Okay, uh, every project is different, but if you just think about it as uh, wearing the right sized coat for the temperature conditions that you're in. Okay, you want to park it in the Arctic, maybe you want two parkers in the Arctic. Uh, you could have a bathing suit and a t-shirt, you know, at the beach. Okay, temperature rated sleeping bags. That's a good way to think of this. Um, let's talk about thermal bridges again. I've already talked about mold and mildew. These are pictures of what can happen if you don't look at the thermal bridges. Um, you know, and these are, these are substandard quality buildings, not enough insulation, poor quality, you know, aluminum double pane windows that are not well air sealed and air leakage coming out from the bottom right. You can see again, the red and the orange, this is air escaping on a balcony connection to an interior living unit, okay? Uh, we wanna look at all these things. These are thermal bridge related issues. You don't want any, okay? Seen this picture already. Uh, I've already described what happens, so I'll move on. Airtight, yes, this is, this is the number one thing you can do, and this is the one that makes people the most nervous. Uh, it has so many benefits. It reduces drought, which is good. Uh, it reduces the possibility of moisture damage, reduces heat loss and humidity loss, uh, depending on the, the climate conditions or the time of year. Keeps things quieter. Noise travels through holes in a building envelope. If you have holes in the air barrier, you're gonna hear noise more so. And again, it supports indoor air health, not directly, but in combination with the ventilation system. The ventilation system only works as well as the air barrier, okay? Windows and doors, solar protection, okay? A common misconception is passive house buildings are passive solar buildings. No, they're not. Passive solar was a movement from the 60s and 70s where people thought, Put a lot of glass on the building, get a lot of solar radiation in the building. It'll be nice and warm and toasty. Yes, it can be, but it can also be way too hot, much too much of the year. I actually visited a passive house, a passive solar house in Maine years ago, an architect friend of my parents back there. And it was a great house. It had a huge amount of glass. Um, they grew vegetables in the wintertime, but it was exceedingly warm. And I was there in the wintertime. Um, so you need the right balance of passive solar, okay? Uh, radiation and protection from radiation. Uh, windows and shading, yes, I've already talked about that. The right amount of the right amount of glazing, the right kind of glazing, and the right amount of shading for that glazing. It all comes into play, and it all it's all part of the design and analysis. Uh, if you do all these things, you do get comfort. We actually look at, when we're looking at a building, we look at the indoor comfort levels. Uh, and we look at the windows specifically because they're the weakest part of the building. 
And what we're looking at is, well, what's the indoor temperature on the surface of that window? It should not go below 64 degrees, essentially. Um, if it's below 64, then somebody standing close to that window is going to be uncomfortable. They're going to be cold if it's cold outside. We don't want that. Um, it works. What more can I say? Uh, shading. We look at all kinds of shading. We look at overhangs. We look at where the window is placed inside the building assembly. That affects how much solar radiation gets in or doesn't get in. We look at adjacent trees, buildings, vegetation, structures. We look at the adjacent buildings. We look at the adjacent landscape, like mountains, for instance. It can make a difference, or even hills. All of these things make a difference. They all get factored in. They have to, or you, you don't get good analysis. Okay, here's the heat recovery. Uh, hygienic ventilation is a foundational goal, remember? It's all about the people on the inside. Uh, I've described how this works. Uh, there's no recirculation. It's clean and filtered all year round. It reduces heat loss and reduces humidity in the summertime. Um, it is very possible in our climate zone to design a passive house that has a heat recovery ventilation system that requires no additional heating or cooling equipment, zero. Now the energy code won't let you do that, but you can do that. Um, it's entirely possible. So this is, this is the engine that sort of makes that happen once you adhere to all the other principles. Uh, we look at internal heat gains. People give off approximately 330 BTUs per hour under normal activities. That helps keep the building warm on the inside in the wintertime. Appliances and equipment do the same. Lighting does the same. The heat recovery ventilator gives off heat to the surface. So the passive house analysis looks at all of this stuff. Okay. Active heating, excuse me, active heating, cooling, and dehumidification. Uh, maybe. Uh, like I said, maybe you don't need any of that stuff. But if you do, typically we're going to see a 75% reduction in equipment sizing, a 95% reduction in the usage of that equipment. So you can, if you couple that with extremely efficient equipment, the amount of energy used to keep the building comfortable gets reduced amazingly significantly. Um, it's, it's hard to believe until you actually see it and you look at the analysis and you step inside one of these buildings. And here it says often all electric. Well, in this day and age, I'm going to say it's always all electric anymore. That, that's where we're going. That's where we need to go. You want everything efficient? Okay. You don't want any gas. You want efficient appliances. You want heat pump heating and cooling equipment, you want heat pump water heaters, you want all of that stuff, okay? Um, like I said, smart systems enhance high performance, they don't compensate for poor performance. You don't throw hardware at the problem, you throw smart design at the problem. It is global, passive health is everywhere. Uh, I'm sure there are some countries where they don't exist, uh, but let's just look at a few more examples. China. Um, this is just one building, but remember I mentioned that the whole city being built there to certified passive house standards. Uh, they've, they've picked up on this in a big way in China. Uh, United Kingdom, this is a community center. It has a couple of very large swimming pools in it. You can certify a passive house gymnasium with swimming pool. Uh, believe it or not, seems unlikely, but it can be done. On the Belgian Congo, their embassy, is built to passive house standards. And in fact, uh, now this is, I'm sorry, in a different country. I'm just going to say passive house in the Belgian Congo, hot and humid thing. Uh, in Australia, there's a university building. Okay. Uh, it's a library and uh, you know a classroom type building. Pennsylvania, low income housing. Okay. Uh, this guy, Tim McDonald, builds really interesting buildings with lots of solar. You can see it on the roof. He's got another building. And again, it's a, a multifamily low-income housing building where the solar panels are on the side of the walls on the outside and on the roof. Um, he's a very creative guy, I have to say. And he builds gorgeous buildings. And they meet all the passive house requirements. 
There's a musician's retreat in uh, Vermont. It is, in essence, a single family home, but they use it more for musicians. Gorgeous on the inside, uh, comfortable on the inside, nice youth, all of that stuff. Um, so uh, again, just another great example. So anyway, this is what Passive House does kind of in a nutshell. Like I said, this is a, you know, a, a 30,000 flyover view of Passive House. It's more like a commercial. This is what it does. This is why it's great as opposed to this is how you do it. Uh, but that's okay. We want to get you interested. And then uh, hopefully you'll step in at some more of these trainings and uh, dig into the details and learn more and more about how you do it. But this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to deliver health and equity in all types of building and uh, build a zero carbon future, uh, which we need to do. There's no question about that. And we need to take care of everybody. Uh, you know, so this is this is uh, the direction that the path of house movement is going in. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you all made it and you stuck with us. It looks like. So then I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah to talk about some upcoming tidbits. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Um... In June, uh, 3C Ren is partnering with Passive House uh, for our, or for their certified Passive House designer course. Uh, it'll be located in Santa Barbara. Uh, it's in person uh, from June 26th through June 30th. So it's, um, it's all five days. Um, and there's an interest form on our uh, 3C Ren website that you can fill out and uh, reserve a seat. And if you go to the next couple of slides, Steve, and maybe one more. Okay, so just really briefly, um, there are AIA learning units for this uh, course today. Um, if you need to provide your AIA number, feel free to email me. My email is there on the screen. And these are just a few 3C REN uh, courses that are coming up. Uh, feel free to check them out. Um, we have just about two minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, ask them at this time. But if not, thank you all for joining. Um, and again, I will be sending out a copy of this recording and the slides uh, to everyone's inbox. And again, I'll just one more time, thank you all very much. Uh, maybe I'll see some of you in Santa Barbara in June. And thank you, Sarah. Thanks for your help. <laughs> of course. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm not seeing any questions come in, so I'll go ahead and end it here. Thank you all again for joining and have a great rest of your day.